and political analyst. He's originally from Ohio. He studied political science at Baldwin Wallace College. In addition to his journalism analysis and commentary, he has engaged in political activism. He was involved in the Occupy Wall Street movement from its planning stages in August of 2011. He's worked against police brutality, mass incarceration, and imperialist war. He lives in New York with his beautiful wife, whom I have met, and she is truly that. He works to promote revolutionary ideology and to support all who fight against the global system of monopoly, capitalist imperialism. Caleb Moppin, greetings, good afternoon, welcome, man, and welcome back, and thanks for going inside the issues. Oh, sure, glad to be here, as always. How are you? Oh, I'm great. I'm good. out here in Bay Ridge, uh, Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, my neighborhood. It's pouring rain, but it's been good weather so far. So, okay. Yeah. Oh, cool. Cool. All is well. You know, after the Caleb, after this shooting, I was listening to the reporting and the analysis of this horrific assault, and I was trying to decide how I was going to approach the conversation. I was talking to my wife. I was talking to other friends, and uh, first, you know, I felt. I need to be sensitive to the tragedy, but at the same time, not allowing a lot of this foolish chatter that we've been hearing on CNN and MSNBC to go unchallenged. Then I saw your email and you, to me, you hit the nail on the head. So with that, share with my audience uh, what you released and what's up on my website I mean, what's up on my Facebook page and talk a bit about how you decided to approach this conversation. Well, in response to the shooting, we heard a lot of people looking into the shooter's Facebook and social media and seeing that he described himself as a Democratic socialist, that he was somebody who campaigned for Bernie Sanders. And we just heard this barrage in the media trying to link this act of of terrorism. This, you know, this person was mad about politics, went and shot people as a result. That's generally considered to be terrorism. People trying to link that act of terrorism to the ideology of socialism or or to to Marxism, communism. I heard people saying this is what the left always does. They engage in this violence. But as someone who's looked into the history of revolutionary movements around the world, there's a lot that's been written about this. And a whole lot has been written um, about what they would call left adventurism or terrorism. And, and if you look throughout the history of the world, you look throughout the history of this country, all the most prominent leaders of revolutionary political movements have always denounced and opposed that kind of activity. Um, they've always made clear that isolated acts of individual terror and violence are, are not, uh, not productive, not something that they strive to carry out, not what their movements are about. They've been very, very clear about that. It's not that they've been silent about it at all. They've been very, very open and adamant that this kind of activity was not helpful. Um, and so I saw this kind of gap, and so I felt it necessary uh, to to make that point because I, I I realized that you know we really can't trust the media, especially when it talks about this kind of rhetoric um, and the way the way they they address these kind of issues. So I felt it was necessary to uh, to point that out. But if one if one looks at the history of revolutionary movements around the world, individual acts of terror, people assassinating public officials and such, that's something that that generally the strongest and loudest currents of the political left have opposed you were you were much more specific in your um in your in your posting in your youtube posting i mean you talked about the the chinese revolution the bolivarian revolution you you i mean you went through a number of revolutions throughout the history of the world and you were very very clear about the sources of them or what the sources of them were not so could you elaborate on that, please? Well, if you look at the history of revolutions around the world, these revolutions generally uh, are acts of self-defense. Um, they, they take place in, 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 in circumstances where people have tried peaceful means, um, and they are under attack and they are, they are forced to defend themselves. If you look at the Russian Revolution, probably you know, you know, one of the most well-studied events. This wasn't just people just going out and blowing things up and being crazy. What had happened was you had a war going on. You had a czar who was an autocrat. People had no democratic rights. A lot of the population, you know, was living in in extreme poverty. Um, And and there was an uprising for democracy, peaceful protests for democracy that were suppressed. Um, And then in that context, in the context of these uprisings, these things called Soviets or workers' councils were formed. 
these are like community assemblies that were formed. And then you saw the, uh, the government uh, that came into being after the, the czar was toppled trying to crush them, trying to smash these Soviets. And so these Soviets then take up arms to defend themselves. And as a result, we have the Soviet Union. Um, and uh, it, was, it was, you know, it, it seems like, you know, one interesting historical parallel is, you know, you, you can look around the world. You can look at the Bolivarian revolutions in Latin America, right? Where this is, these are democratic elections. These are leaders who've run in elections, peacefully taken power in a constitutional manner, and then faced an onslaught of, of violence from the old system, um, and then and mobilize the population to defend the democratic elections. But you can even look at the history of this country. It's very interesting if you, you read some of the debates that went on within the Black Panther Party, the, the division between Eldridge Cleaver and Huey Newton, where Huey Newton is making very, very clear to Eldridge Cleaver that the kind of uh, ultra-left violent activity was not the answer, and that rather the way that the Panthers could grow and become an effective force was uh, through what he called survival pending revolution, things like the free breakfast program and other, other programs that would build ties and build up community. And that was, this was Huey Newton. This is someone who'd been to China, who'd been to Cuba, who'd studied these revolutions. But he saw that the, the way to advance was to tie, the, tie themselves with the masses of people, that self-defense was one thing, but ultra-left adventurous violence and terror was not accepted. And, and this, this, wasn't just, this wasn't just passing words. I mean, these were, were intense discussions that went on during that period. And you can even take it up to uh, the Iranian Revolution. One of the things that I find very interesting, um, <clears throat> when President Trump went to Saudi Arabia and uh, King Sa- or Prince Salman was, um, was giving his speech and he said he was talking about terrorism. And he said, you know, we've been in this uh, in this country 300 years and terrorism did not start until the Khomeini revolution. And I said to myself, well, wait a minute, that was they didn't fire any weapons. They didn't. They, they just poured in the Iranians poured into the street and refused to listen and, and, and to um, go along with the with the with the dictates of the Shah any longer. And the Shah looked out from his helicopter and realized he couldn't control his people anymore. So that, what to me, was another example of a nonviolent, peaceful revolution, which for some some reason in this country gets contorted and twisted into being uh, uh, something of a terrorist act. Sure. Uh, you know, the, the language that we've heard coming out of the Middle East is some of the most confused language. When Trump went, you know, to Saudi Arabia... We all know about the 28 pages, right, that show extensive uh, Saudi involvement and connections with the 9-11 hijackers. We know what's going on in Syria, where these anti-government forces who are being given guns by the Saudi government, who are committing acts of terrorism against the Syrian government, uh, we know that they're being armed uh, by the Saudis, and that ISIS, the, you know, the, the most hated terrorists in the world, the ISIS terrorists emerged as a faction. From you, we're having, hey, Caleb, we're having, we're having a little trouble... Um, Tr- Caleb, yes, we're, we're having a little Trump trouble. Pointed at Iran, and this is kind of a, a hypocrisy we see in, in some of the. There rhetoric. we go. Okay, well, let's do this. We're having a little trouble hearing you, so let, let's take a break now. Um, okay. We'll, we're we're going to come back, but we're having some, something happened with your phone, so we're going to uh, let's take this break now, and we'll come back and we'll have that problem. Curled up, ladies and gentlemen. Dr. Wormley on here. Caleb Moppin is my guest, uh, a journalist and activist. Uh, you can go to his website. Excuse me. You can go to his website, uh, Caleb Moppin. info. Caleb Moppin. M a u p i n. info. Incredible insight and articles. Do yourselves a favor. Listen to this, Gil Scott Heron. Go to my website, WilmerLeon.com. Go to WilmerLeon.com. You can get my book. You can uh, help support the book tour. You can get all kind of information at WilmerLeon.com. Keep it locked right here at Sirius XM 126 Urban View. The military and the monetary were shielded by January and were storming into February. Brought us pot generals as luminaries. Two weeks ago, I had heard... They took the honor from the honorary. They took the dignity from the dignitaries. They took the secrets from the secretary, but they left the bitch an obituary. 17, 17 past the hour. Dr. Wimmerleon here. Inside the Issues is where you are. 
And uh, Caleb Moppin, M-A-U-P-I-N, is my guest. Go to calebmoppin.info. Go to calebmoppin.info. Incredible website. Uh, This brother here is uh, doing a whole lot of a whole lot of interesting, insightful work that uh, you need to pay attention to. Caleb, thank you so much for staying with me. Uh, hey, before we before we get into the um, your piece, uh, Western backed radical Islamists are dangerous. I wanted to, there were a couple of points I wanted to wrap up on this uh, shooter in uh, Virginia, and we've got a couple callers we're going to go to. Um, one of the, there are a couple things that I found very interesting um, as people continue to talk about Mr. James Hodgkinson. Um, one is. You know, President Trump has spent an awful lot of time talking to us about these hordes of crazed Mexicans that are streaming over our borders and wreaking havoc and raping and pillaging across the terrain. Uh, we He spent a whole lot of time talking about these crazed Muslims, these jihadists and uh, these uh, Sharia law followers and but James Hodgkinson was not from the Middle East. He was from the Midwest. He was from Illinois. Um, what we what I see being played out here on the American political landscape time and time again, it's not the terrorist, it's not the international jihadist. It is the frustrated American. But for some reason, that narrative does not seem to hold sway or carry the day in a lot of the analysis that we're hearing on CNN, MSNBC, and some of these other channels. Sure. It's a great example of how the United States is becoming an increasingly unstable country. And I I think this instability is coming from all sides. Um, if you look at, you know, what's been happening out in Berkeley, California, where you have these, you know, right wing speakers and then you have crowds of people showing up and, you know, setting off, uh, setting off fireworks and, and, you know, engaging in battle and destroying property in response to these right wing speakers. If you if you look at what's happened, um, you know, with with some of the, the hate crimes that have gone on, um, you know, if you look at all throughout U.S. society, things are becoming less and less stable and we're seeing kind of a pattern of. Americans not just disagreeing with each other about politics, but, uh, but becoming violent in the process. And I, I don't think you can restrict this to one incident or one ideology or, or one perspective. I think this is a widespread problem. And a lot of Americans seem to realize that something is wrong in their country. And, and increasingly, they're, they're, they're engaging in violence as an attempt to resolve it. And that's kind of a widespread problem we're seeing in the United States. And I, I, you know, the media is often, you know, you'll notice that there's kind of a bias. Uh, when there's an act of, of, of violence like this and the person doing it espouses, you know, racism or far-right ideology, uh, you'll have the left that'll say, oh, well, the ideology is to blame, and the right will say, well, it's mental illness, forget about ideology. And then it flips, you know, and people try it, and then, if it, you know, in this case, you say, oh, well, this has nothing to do with this person's beliefs, this is just their mental illness, but... When it gets down to it, we're seeing an overall pattern that, you know, people taking up weapons in, and, and, and trying to act out their extreme, crazed alienation from U.S. society. And you're right, a lot of these people are Americans, and a lot of them are white Americans. I would say, the, you know, the, the majority of these shooters are white Americans uh, who used to have a, a very high standard of living. Um, and that standard of living has gone down. And we're seeing this kind of, you know, they talk about the diseases of despair, you know, the people dying of heroin. Uh, people, people committing suicide, you know, a younger generation of white Americans is realizing they'll never have the standard of living that their parents had. And in response, they're becoming, uh, you know, you know there's, there's all kinds of problems. And one of the side effects we're seeing, I think that you can link uh, this kind of rise of shooters and, and extremists to the decline of the U.S. middle class, the, the, the dropping standard of living. I think there's something to be said there. Oh, I think there is an awful lot to be said there. Um uh, they these uh, a number of these people have been uh, described by a friend of mine down frat brother of mine down in uh, Florida as these are the white people that the real white people left behind, meaning that a lot of these working class and middle class people who bought into this whole idea of white privilege, they bought into this whole idea of the American dream. 
and they now find that over the last 20 years their wages have remained stagnant, that they are having to mortgage their present in order to pay for their future, to maintain a lifestyle or a perception of a lifestyle that they've been convinced they're suppo- that they're entitled to have. And they've also now been convinced that the reasons for their stagnation are not because of globalization, not because uh, the iPhone is now made in India and no longer is not even made in Indiana. And so they're, they've been taught this xenophobic blame the other for their plight instead of looking to the guy who talked about He's for the common man, that being Donald Trump, when his products are made in China. Absolutely true. I mean, you go you go throughout this country, you know, Cleveland, uh, you know, used to be, uh, you know, just full of steel yards, you know, lots of steel workers making very high wages. Uh, you go to Pittsburgh, you go to Detroit, formerly the prosperous motor, motor city. Uh, there's been, you know, an economic devastation that has taken place. I mean, I'm originally from Ohio, but I live in New York City now because when I was living in Ohio, I mean, just forget it. If you're looking for a job, you're looking to support yourself, just forget it. I mean, I, and so many people that I've gone to school with have, have just left, you know. Uh, the the industrial, industrial middle class that kind of defined the United States mm-hmm. uh, has been eliminated. And, and there's kind of a narrative that has developed uh, in which they blame immigrants for it. Uh, you know, they, they blame, uh, you know, maybe a lack of Christianity. Uh, but th- there seems to be, you know, a lack in any of this, what they might call class consciousness, this understanding that, that you know, that, that there might be a blame for a group of very rich people that are making a lot of profits and don't seem to have any loyalty to the country or to the communities where they hire people or used to hire people. Um, and and there's, there's, there's kind of a gap there, and, uh, and, and you see a division. And on top of that, uh, you know, a lot of these areas that were once prosperous were also almost completely white. You know, they, these are areas where, you know, there were no people of color, no black people, no Latino people. And so there, there wasn't kind of an, a, a perspective on that. And so there's kind of a fear as they're seeing their standard of living decrease. Uh, they're also seeing, you know, seeing, you know, an increasing number of people that don't look like them in prominent places. And there's a fear. Oh, my gosh, the world is slipping out of my hands. Things are changing. I'm under attack. And then, of course, you have a president who then tries to appeal to that and says, well, I'm your savior. I'm going to make America great again. I, I'm going to make it like it was before. Right. That's that's what make America great again is essentially saying is I'm going to make it like it was before. But we all know that that doesn't work that way. Time travel is, is only for science fiction novels. You can't restore the past. You can't you can't make things like they were before. Uh, you have to figure out how to make things better in the present and the future. But but there is a division. And often when people have had it good. And then they, they start to lose what they have. Their instinct is, let's go back to the way we did it before, not let's try something completely new. Um, and that, that tends to be how, how the human mind operates. If, if things were going well uh, before, you want to restore how it was before. But it, it is interesting to see that, you know, the, the, number of, the number of people who voted for Trump but also voted for Sanders. And there seems to be an openness among a lot of people to hearing uh, different perspectives. And, and uh, you know, there was a time, you know, in, in the USA, if you said anything like, well, maybe capitalism isn't a good system, people say, well, why don't you go move to some other country? <laughs> but look at these polls that are coming out now. I mean, huge percentages of the U.S. public say that they don't like capitalism and are open to hearing, you know, alternative perspectives, the kind of perspectives that have been limited to, you know, a very small far left fringe are now very widespread. However, at the same time, we're also seeing stuff that was far right fringe, you know, as right. well also being expected and i think that, that the increasing instability is accompanying a kind of a kind of openness to ideology everyone in the usa seems to realize that things aren't going well and that a solution is needed uh, the question is where will that solution come from one of the other things that i wanted to touch on quickly about this shooter uh, the 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 field where the shooting took place was in the del rey section of um Alexandria, Virginia, uh, a pr- predominantly white area, a fairly well-off area, and they were interviewing people from the neighborhood, and they all talked about how kind of insular the neighborhood is. Everybody knows everybody. They were painting this I- idyllic um, image of you know how everything there is so close-knit, 
and everybody and, and then I, then you hear the story that this guy lived on the street in his van for James Hodgkinson lived on the street in his van in front of the YMCA for six weeks and nobody noticed him. Nobody really said anything. Nobody found it odd. And that made me wonder if this was a matter of um, racial profiling in reverse. The, the fact that he's a white guy didn't really seem to threaten anybody. And he, he was going to the YMCA every day. He was sitting there talking to the mayor, the former mayor of, Ale- of, of Alexandria every day. He was in the bars. He was drinking. And then he'd go back and get in his van and sleep on the street. But nobody called the cops and said, hey, there's this odd dude parked in front of the, the YMCA. It, that, to me, I just found that as being odd. Yeah, it's a very interesting observation. Absolutely. Let's do this. We have a caller. Um, let's let's take Lee on one in Virginia. Lee, good afternoon. You are going inside the issues with Wilmer Leon and Caleb Moppin. Hey, good afternoon, gentlemen. Good afternoon. Uh, Dr. Leon, you, you stole my thunder. I live about a mile away from uh, Delray. In fact, I go to the Aldi's, which is right across the street from that park. Mm-hmm. Um, it, and it's strange, like you said, how this guy could be in the neighborhood sleep in his van for, for months upon end, and nobody noticed him as, as being strange. What particularly is strange is that his wife was, was being interviewed and said he's been gone for 90 days, and she hasn't even called the police to report him missing. Let me ask you this question, Lee. If you, yes, if you, had decide, if you decided to sleep in your car in front of the YMCA, how long do you, th- living in that neighborhood, living in that area, so you know this much better than I do, how long do you think it would be before someone came and tapped on your window and asked you what you were doing there? I'll, I'll do you one better. When I moved here from, from uh, Ohio to Manassas, I was trying to figure out how to get on the VRE in the morning, so I was driving with my clothes in the back of my car on a rack at about 11 o'clock at night going to the, to the Manassas VRE station. I got pulled over by the police with me being in the state less than six hours. So that answers that. The VRE, for people who don't know, is, is, is the railway. Virginia Ra- Railway. What's VRE stand for? Virginia Railway. What's the Express. E? Express. Okay. So you were just trying to find a train station. Okay. Yes, I, oh, okay. I just got to the state, and I've been here less than six hours and got pulled over. Where are you going? Where are you coming from? You got Ohio tags. What's going on with your clothes in the back? Okay. All right, so that, well, that, that answers that question. <laughs> okay. Yes, sir. So uh, you, you, my my assessments then, Lee, are not far off. Yes, yes. So your assessment is, is exactly right. I would probably be maybe a couple of hours if I was sleeping in my car in at, at the um, the YMCA as a as an African American. I've been pointed out in probably within hours. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Lee. I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Have a good afternoon, gentlemen. All right. We're coming up on 3131 past the hour, and uh, Caleb Moppin is my guest. He is a, a journalist, um, uh, an analyst, and uh, uh, Caleb, when we come back, I, I now want to talk about uh, a piece that you wrote on June 8th, Let's Face It, Western-Backed Radical Islamists Are Dangerous. Uh, let's talk about that on the other side, if you can stay with me. Certainly. Great. That bag, that Keep it locked right here. Series XM 126. Urban View 3131 past the hour. Get together whenever they think it's necessary. War in the desert sometimes sure is scary, but they beamed out the war to all their subsidiaries. Tried to make the military and the monetary from thousands of miles in the Saudi Arabian sanctuary. Kept us all wondering if all of this was really truly necessary. Coming up on 35, coming up on 35 past the hour, Dr. Wilmer Leon here going inside the issues here in Sirius XM 126 Urban View. Got to give a big shout out to my number one fan, Candace Pay, down in Richmond, Virginia. Good afternoon. I know she is listening. I know she has her family listening, as always, and I greatly, greatly appreciate it. And of course, uh, my number two fan, Penny. Uh, Penny Socks is out there as well. 
Penny Owens Socks is out there. And Penny, you have been certified by Candace as my number two fan. So I greatly, greatly appreciate your support as well. Let's go to line. Oh, my guest, before I do that, my guest is Caleb Moppin. Go to Caleb Moppin, M A U P I N dot info. Great, great articles. This guy is an incredible writer and um, covers a vast array of of issues, international and national. Uh, Anthony in Pennsylvania on two. Anthony in, in Pennsylvania on two. Good afternoon. You're going inside the issues with Wilmer Leon and Caleb Moppin. Oh, yes. Good afternoon, Wilmer. I'm a long time racer now. Yes, sir. I'm an admirer of former Washington area person who used to go to Howard University for a lot of the rap on center. But anyway, I'm an older guy. I just wanted to say that uh, a lot of those companies, most of those companies that gone overseas to poor countries, including China, where they pay slave labor wages, they are white male on those companies. And many of the people in the Midwest, take any of the five states that suffer, Pennsylvania, uh, Illinois, and all of those uh, all states where have been emptied out in so-called rust belts, mm-hmm. those companies are owned by white men. Some of them live in the same area of the people. Take a town, 50,000, let's say, in the area of Pennsylvania, uh, Ohio. They've been emptied out. And the people who have been laid off, a lot of them have been spoon-fed from the time they're in high school. They come out, they get a little job, they buy a little house, they buy a boat up in that area. I live in the area 12 years. They buy boats a lot. They remortgage their homes to go on trips and all kinds of things, send the kids to school. A lot of those people don't have any entrepreneurial spirit. I'm not blaming them for the empty up, but they're blaming the wrong people. Why don't they go to those communities outside of the suburbs and look for where those people live they could find out and demonstrate against them? They're not going to do that. They stupidly blame the people who are blameless. Now, many of the cities in the Midwest are begging, even in the East, they're begging immigrants to come because when immigrants move into a community, whether it's a city or suburb, uh, a lot of scholars of research, including myself, they revivorate the community because they start business. They're more entrepreneurial than Americans who are American born. Let me. A lot of these white people are they're spoon fed and they're okay. lazy, not to work a job, but lazy to take let, risks to run businesses. Let me That's le- what I say. Okay, Anthony, thank you. Let me let uh, Caleb respond. Caleb? Well, I. Uh, it's very interesting that he's observing because, you know, I'm from Ohio originally. I'm actually from a little town called Orville. It's where Smucker's Jelly is made. That's where I grew up. Mm. But I, went, I recently went to southern Ohio to a town called, a place called Clinton County. And we, I did kind of a story about the irony because it was called Clinton County, but it went almost 60, 70 percent for Trump. But one thing that I noticed when I was in Clinton County, Ohio, down by the, the border with Kentucky, is that I noticed that I didn't see anyone under the age of 35 the entire time I was there. Uh, it was kind of amazing to see so few people, a lot of older folks, they were trying to know that they have in the area is heroin. But, uh, but, but yeah, the young people have all just fled because there just are not uh, opportunities there. Uh, if you want to work in fast food, fine. But if you want, if you want to have a, a quote unquote middle class job, you got to go to California. You got to go to the New England, New York City, New Jersey. Just, just forget living in, in these areas. These areas have been devastated. And, and on that basis, I, I, I can see why a lot of these areas might want immigrants to come, because they can come there and spend some money. I mean, these areas, I mean, they're, they, there are parts of this country, from what I understand at this point, where they're literally depaving the roads uh, and replacing paved roads with dirt roads, because the cities cannot maintain uh, a paved roads any longer. Now, Donald Trump, he just did this thing about infrastructure. Remember, it was infrastructure yeah. he was going to start rebuilding. Well, I, I can see a lot of people that would really hope that he meant it, but, but then again, we haven't seen the infrastructure yet. He didn't really lay out a big plan to start rebuilding things. So uh, I can see how that, that thing that he raised during his campaign of rebuilding the country, highways and bridges, infrastructure, uh, I can see how that would appeal to people. But at the same time, we saw infrastructure week, and he didn't really seem to talk about that. He didn't really explain how he was going to start rebuilding the country. Well, and, and his supposed explanation or rationale for paying for this infrastructure program is supposed to be from this increase in GNP, the growth in the economy that's supposed to come from his horrific tax cuts. And that, to me, sounds a lot like where he stole Make America Great Again. That sounds a lot like Ronald Reagan, Reaganomics, or what George Bush called voodoo economics, uh, supply side, I mean, there are a number of names for it, all of which from the economists that I talk to and in, in economy that economics that I studied doesn't work. Sure. Well, well, ordinary people, working class people spend money. So they spend their majority of their money to survive. Right. You, you pay your rent, you pay your mortgage, you, you pay for food. 
And so you keep spending money in order to survive. But people with billions and billions of dollars, they, they invest their money in order to make a profit, right? They, they, and if, if they can't make a profit investing their money, it just sits in a bank somewhere, right? Uh, and, and that's the reality. So this idea that if, we, if we're going to restart the economy by giving tax cuts to very wealthy people, it just doesn't pan out, you know, because unless those, those folks can see that their investment will return a profit, unless they can see that the market is going well and that the economy is going well and if they invest, it's going to have a return, they're not going to spend their money. So, But if you put more money into the hands of ordinary folks, they tend to spend that money, and that goes into the economy, right? That's the Keynesian idea. That's why Roosevelt, during the Great Depression, he started hiring people to build bridges and highways. I know that uh, I know that Guardia Airport in New York City was built by the Roosevelt administration. Mm-hmm. I know that the, the highway to Key West in Florida was built by the Roosevelt administration. A lot of the post offices in this country were built during that period because the idea was to get the economy going again. You ought to hire people get them money, get them spending their money, um, and, and then things will go better. That was the Keynesian idea. But this idea that if we just cut taxes on the rich people, somehow that they are, are going are gonna to just start spending the money, that's just not the economic reality. That, that, that people with billions and billions of dollars, when they have money, they don't, they, don't, they don't start spending it and investing it unless they see a return on it. And here's one thing that, that just came just popped into my head as you were talking about working-class people spending money. Now, though... Won't the problem be, as these working class people start spending their money on shoes and other clothing and, 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 and living, many of the products or too many of the products that they're going to start to purchase are no longer made in this country. So, so the corporation that, that, that is going to reap the benefit from this uptick in purchasing, chances are, are not going to be American companies. Well, uh, there you go. Uh, and that, that points to a bigger problem. And furthermore, right, when you, when you take the jobs to some other country or you, or, you lower, or you lower the pay or you get rid of jobs with automation, fewer people are hired. And when fewer people are hired, less people have spending power. So the more efficient it becomes to create products, the cheaper you can make those products, the fewer workers are getting paid, the fewer products you can buy. And eventually the market is glutted with all these products that cannot be sold, right? I mean, and that, that's kind of the, the, the irony or the, the, the built-in problem of capitalist economics. You're driving to produce. How much can we produce? Produce as much as possible for as little, as little pay. Pay the workers as little as possible. Uh, de-skill the jobs. Make the people as replaceable as possible. But then in the end, workers are also consumers. And if people, people are, don't have wages, they don't have good jobs, you know, pretty soon they can't buy back the products that they're making. It's kind of a, 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 a cycle that, that, you know, that, 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 that products cannot be sold the more efficient you create them. Let's go to Tony in Indiana on one. Tony in Indiana on one. Good afternoon. You're going Inside the Issues with Wilmer Leon and Caleb Moppin. Hey, how you doing, Dr. Leon? Hi to your guest. Doing well, thank you. Good. Let me ask you, I think you guys had a position that uh, terrorism was ineffective. Is that correct? That terrorism was ineffective? Yeah, or didn't work. Or, I, I tuned in. I thought I heard that position. Am I correct on that? No, I, I did not say that. Uh, Caleb, did you say that? No, I, I pointed out that there's been a, a lot of scholarship written by people around the world about the issue of terrorism. Um, and a lot of the, the leftist thinkers throughout history have, have opposed that as, as a tactic and said that it does not change the world, uh, that it, it's ineffective and that, it, that, it's, that it's not a proper behavior. And that when the media tries to blame this act of terrorism in Virginia on left-wing thought, they're just not being consistent with the history. Okay. Okay. Th- that's that's the clear. I heard that. So, so, my, so what, the immediate thing that went back to me is that the founders of this country used terrorism, and based on the fact this country was created, it seemed to be effective. And what really cites one incident that cites me, of course, is the uh, the Boston Tea Party. So I think it just depends on who the terrorists are and who they're going up against on whether it's effective or not. I'm not pro-terrorism. I'm just from a no, history. No, 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 no. That's that's, like that's, that's a that's a sure. that's an interesting point. And 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 before Caleb responds, um, it, I. I was when when Caleb was discussing that, I was thinking along the similar lines in that the um, the king that that the that the the revolution was targeted against a monarchy, 
and I was going into this whole thing about sovereignty that I had talked about in in the earlier hour, but that I'll let Caleb respond. Go ahead. Well, I think we need to get our definitions straight about about what terrorism is. Terrorism is activity designed to terrify uh, one's enemy, right? The idea is that you strike terror, you make people fear for their lives, people become afraid and terrified, and so they give in and, and give what what you want. I don't think that the colonists were trying to make the, the, the British fear for their lives by destroying, uh, by destroying the tea in, in Boston's harbor. What that was about was essentially that there was a, a, a monopoly being enforced, that the East India Company was essentially forcing the colonists to buy products from a British corporation, um, and that there was a monopoly being enforced. And in response, uh, they felt that a, an act of mass property destruction uh, was a way to, to counter that state-enforced monopoly. Um, and it was it was a mass mobilization of people. It was it was certainly illegal. It was certainly destruction of property. But it, it wasn't it wasn't killing people. It wasn't assassinating public officials. It wasn't intended to make people fear for their lives and give in out of terror. Uh, it, it was a different kind of activity. And there was a huge mass you know base what? for it. You know, go ahead, Tony. If I may, if I may, yeah. if I may answer, Jesse, this, this is and I just want to say, I think this is the big disconnect. Uh, it seems like a lot of white people are reluctant to acknowledge that the people that founded this country used terrorist tactics. Now, now you gave your definition of terrorism, but to me, terrorism is a tactic used by an organization to further their social, political, and or socio-political agenda. And it's usually used by people who are the underdogs who do not have an organized or well stocked army when they're going up against the Goliath. So they use guerrilla or terrorist tactics to, to strike because they simply don't have an air force. Uh, they don't have a fleet of tanks. They don't have battleships. So they have to go in strategically and make strikes. Okay. So here's, okay. So Tony, so Tony product, but it's, but it's go ahead. Okay. So, so here, here's my question to you. Yes. Using your definition, what uh-huh. is what is it about the particular tactic that is employed that makes it terror? That makes it terrorism. What is it about that tactic that makes it terrorism versus uh, political expression versus um, uh, you know uh, uh, other methods of political expression? What is it about the, the tactic? Violence, the violence that is associated and connected with it. Okay. Okay. But isn't it? And, okay. Oh, go ahead. No, no. And what? And, it, and the, the fear is a byproduct of the action. I don't think they go in with the idea. They, I mean, now throughout history, you know, because there's been probably study, they know that fear, it will create fear. And that fear is generally created among the civilians. Mm-hmm. However, the idea behind terrorism is simply to strike with what you have rather than what you don't have. So I'm going to blow up a plane. You know, the guys will blow up a plane because they simply don't have an army. So they got to strike any way they can to impact on whoever they're trying to okay. make an impact on and further their agenda. Let me let, okay, so let, me, it, let me, okay, let me let Caleb, ahead. let me let Caleb respond. Go ahead, Caleb. Well, I'll respond by saying I do have a little bit of a different definition than what the caller is using. And I, I don't think that, that necessarily the, the method that one uses is what defines it. I think it's rather the intent. Um, but I will say there was terrorism during the American Revolution, absolutely. And the colonists did use terrorism against the Native Americans. One example that comes to my mind is Jeanette and Hutton, where you had uh, a group of Native Americans who were pacifists, uh, who were, were simply, you know, they, they took no side between the British or the Americans. Um, but during during the war, they did give medical comfort to British British soldiers, and as a result, uh, they lined up all these Native Americans and bashed their heads in with hammers. One of the most uh, egregious, horrendous massacres of Native Americans was carried out by American colonists during the American Revolution, and it was absolutely terror. It was it was targeting men, women, and children, intending to terrify Native Americans. If you help the British, this is what we are going to do, and that was absolutely terrorism. I would say. Uh, it's not that they didn't use terrorism. I just wouldn't define necessarily the Boston Tea Party or, or the Green Mountain Boys. Uh, I wouldn't define what they did necessarily as terrorism. But terrorism certainly went on during that period, no doubt. But weren't, weren't ships blown up during the, during the Boston Tea Party? Didn't, they, didn't the colonists blow up some of those ships carrying the teas and stuff? Uh, from what I understand, the they, they got on the ships. 
and and they took the key in the ship and dumped it into the harbor. It was it was mass destruction of property. Uh, I don't think there was any explosion any explosions or anything in in the Boston massacre. But I'm not a history expert on that period. Um, yeah, they, they I was all yeah. yeah. Just based on my teaching, I'm understanding okay. that they all, not only they dumped the key, but they destroyed the ships via explosives and what have you. So okay. I just think that, I think that, that, but like I said, I just think that terrorism is a tactic usually used by the underdog to further their social, political, and or both initiatives through the through the tactics of violence or what but, have you. But uh, Tony, I, I, uh, I thank you very yeah. much. And and to Caleb's point, um, I you I believe you also have to factor in the intent of the act along with the methodology employed. But Tony, thank you because I, I got to get out because yeah. I, wanna, right, I no want to I want problem, bro. No hey, man, problem. You I appreciate it. you listening. Uh, right. Caleb um, went a little longer on this one than had intended, but would like for you uh, as in fact talking about terrorism um, you have a piece called Let's Face It, Western backed radical Islamists, Islamists, Islamists are dangerous. Uh, talk about that, please. Well, this bomber in Manchester, right? No one in the mainstream media in the U.S. seems to point out this guy was part of a group called the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group. His father had fought for them. Um, and this was one of the groups that was supported by the United States and Britain to bring down Gaddafi in Libya, to bring down the Libyan government, the Islamic Socialist Government of Libya. This was, this was a group that was backed and funded by the United States to take down the Libyan government. And there's a whole history, there's like almost a pattern of this happening, that these, you know, when we talk about Islamic terrorists, a lot of times these are people that were supported by the United States to bring down some kind of independent government around the world, whether it's in in Afghanistan, whether it's in Iraq or Syria, and then they turn around and and attack and and engage in the same kind of terrorist activities against the West, and and we're shocked. I mean, what the, the Libyan Islamic fighting group did in Libya was not very much different from what uh, Salman Abedi, who was a member of it, did in Manchester. They killed civilians. They, they slaughtered people. We were funding them and arming them and supporting them when they did that in Libya. And then they do it in Manchester, and we're shocked, and, and, and it's terrorism. And I think that that didn't get pointed out. I think that, that the fact that this guy was in a group, the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group, that was being supported by our tax dollars to bring down the Libyan government is a scandal if there ever was one. And so Donald Trump going to Saudi Arabia, talking uh, with uh, Prince Salman, and he. The funny thing is, he used September 11th as uh, the big uh, historical marker for his discussion about terror. But he never mentioned that 15 of the hijackers on September 11th were carrying Saudi passports. Absolutely, and. And who is Osama bin Laden? He is, he is one of the heirs of probably the wealthiest construction firm, one of the wealthiest families in Saudi Arabia. They have essentially a state monopoly on construction. If you're going to do construction in Saudi Arabia, you've got to go through the bin Laden family, right? And in the 1980s, the big new Brzezinski, uh, the CIA analyst uh, and, and strategist who just died, uh, he, he worked with Osama bin Laden to fight in Afghanistan against the People's Democratic Party. Uh, and, and the government of Afghanistan was eventually toppled by Osama bin Laden, a terrorist working in coordination with the United States against the Afghan government. Um, and in the 80s, they didn't call bin Laden a terrorist. In fact, there's a movie, The Living Daylight, the James Bond movie, uh, and it ends, it says, this film is dedicated to the Mujahideen fighters of Afghanistan. Well, who was that? That was Osama bin Laden. You know, he was leading the Mujahideen fighters of Afghanistan to tear apart the, de- the People's Democratic Party, and eventually, eventually, as a result, we had the Taliban that came into power. Um, and, and there's a history of this. Uh, you know, the, the Zarnev brothers in Boston, these are a, a few other examples. People say, well, this is Islamic terrorism. Well, they were Chechen, and there's a whole history of the United States supporting Chechen, Chechen separatists against the Soviet Union, right? Uh, during the Soviet period, uh, you know, they're, they're, the, the Chechens claimed that their Islamic traditions were being oppressed, and so Saudi Arabia worked with the United States to arm and train Chechens to fight against the Russians and against the Soviet Union, right? So these, these terrorists, uh, you know, that we talk about, these are people that are being armed and trained by the United States to target governments we don't like. Uh, and it seems that whenever they target the government of Afghanistan or the government of Gaddafi in Libya or the, or the, or the Russians in Chechnya, uh, the U.S. media describes them as freedom fighters and heroes. But then when they turn around and kill people in New York City, 
when they turn around and kill people in Manchester and Britain, all of a sudden we realize these people are terrorists. Uh, it's, it's a bit of a double standard, and we ought to look at the history of these groups. Um, Saudi Arabia has a particular interpretation of the Islamic faith that you can call Wahhabism. Uh, and Wahhabism is, is an ideology uh, that, that if you look at Osama bin Laden, if you look at ISIS, uh, these groups are almost all Wahhabi. All the, the terrorist attacks that we associate with quote-unquote Islamic terror are, are carried out by individuals, almost all of them are, are carried out by individuals who adhere to this interpretation of Islam that we know as Wahhabism. And the base of Wahhabism is Saudi Arabia. It's not Iran. It's not Syria. It's not Saddam Hussein and Iraq. Wahhabism comes out of Saudi Arabia, but this is something that the U.S. media doesn't acknowledge. Um, and, and, you know, uh, when Donald Trump went to Saudi Arabia, the country that is the origin of Wahhabism, to, to build a coalition against terrorism, he should have been asking himself what, what, what's going on here. There, there seems to be quite, quite a double standard. You know, when there was that horrendous terrorist attack in Iran, when ISIL attacked Iran, U.S. media didn't even blink an eye. You know, uh, 17 people were killed in Iran by the ISIL terrorists. And U.S. media barely gave it any coverage. And in fact, a lot of Americans don't seem to realize that there are a lot of Iranians on the battlefield in Syria fighting against ISIL. I know when I went to Iran, I, I, a member of my family said to me, oh, well, are you sure you want to go to Iran? I mean, I, I know ISIL is there, you know. And I, I said, well, no, I had to explain to this fam family member of mine, no, Iran is fighting against ISIL. Iran is on the side of the Syrian government against ISIL and the Wahhabi terrorists. It's Saudi Arabia. Uh, Saudi Arabia that has some shady ties to, to ISIL. So there's, there's, there's just a, a lot of misunderstanding. You know, we, we, when these phrases Islamic terrorists are used, people, people just kind of dismiss it. They associate an entire religion, but it's much more complex. And that there, there is a, a section uh, of the, the world's Muslim population that is linked to terrorism, and that section seems to be adherence of the Wahhabi interpretation, which is based in Saudi Arabia. And they tend to kill more Muslims than anybody else. Sure. Uh, and that's, that's the other thing, is that, you know, there's, there's widespread opposition to ISIS, probably the loudest from Muslims, because who does ISIS kill? It kills Muslims. I mean, that's, that's who they've been killing, Muslims and people that they consider to be uh, people that they call apostates. One of the main goals of the Daesh terrorists is to topple the Islamic Republic of Iran, which they say, uh, they say that they're Shia apostates and, and that they want to overthrow the Iranian government. That's not being told to us. Uh, uh, when, when, when Trump goes throughout the Middle East talking about Iran as if it's the center of terror, uh, let's, let's look at these terrorist attacks. Bin Laden was a Saudi, right? A lot of the ISIS fighters are, are Chechens. A lot of them are Saudis. A lot of them are people from different countries in the region. It, Iran is really not the center of terrorism that Trump makes it out to be. And as and we, we need to close with this, as Donald Trump was in Saudi Arabia talking about the horrors in Iran, the day before, uh, uh, yeah, the day before he gave his speech, they held a free and fair election that that got over 70 percent participation, and a Iranian political moderate was elected, someone who was championing strengthening ties with the West and battling um, extremism, but that seemed to have gone unnoticed. Sure, I mean, just yesterday Trump gave this fiery speech in Miami. Uh, talking against the Cuban government for not being democratic uh, and demanding that they have a free and fair election. Well, when have they ever had a free and fair election in Saudi Arabia? This country is an absolute monarchy. It's the only country in the world where they're still cutting people's heads off, public beheading as a form of execution. So for Trump to be dancing around with the Saudi king and then condemning Cuba for allegedly not having free elections really smacks of hypocrisy. And he needs to check his own election. With that, we got to get out. Caleb Moppin, hey man, thank you so much for giving me time on this Saturday and spending, staying on the street talking to me for as long as you did. I greatly appreciate it and look forward to getting you back. Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure. Always thank a pleasure.